Okay. <laughs> we'll start. We'll start soon. Wait thirty seconds. I assume we're waiting for people to actually filter into the Zoom room. Yeah. yeah okay. Okay, seems like we're ready to go. Uh, so folks, hello uh, and welcome to our first Center for Constitutional Studies event of this academic year and our first in-person charter series event since the start of the pandemic, uh, which makes this an, an especially exciting moment, at least for me. Uh, so my name is Dr. Richard Maley. Uh, I'm the director of the center and I'm delighted to be here today with Professor Malcolm Lavoie of the Faculty of Law here at the U of A. Uh, but before I do a, pro a proper intro for Malcolm, uh, I'd just like to begin by acknowledging that the Centre for Constitutional Studies and the Faculty of Law uh, are located in Edmonton on Treaty 6 territory, and the Centre accordingly acknowledges and honours the ancestors, traditions, and indeed the spirit that first drew Indigenous peoples, the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Salto, and Inuit to this gathering place. And in acknowledging the territory that we're on, we also acknowledge that we enjoy the benefits of treaty and we call upon the spirit and intent of treaty to maintain us in a stronger, more enduring, more equal relationship. And of course, we recognize as well that land acknowledgements like this one that are only one small, indeed one minuscule uh, step in the ongoing process of recognizing and upholding treaty and in the ongoing process of reconciliation in Canada. Now, the reason that we're here today is, of course, to learn about the Charter of Rights uh, and to learn in particular about the place of property uh, and property rights uh, in both the Charter and the Canadian Constitution. Uh, and to this end, it's my distinct pleasure uh, to introduce our guest today, Professor Malcolm Lavoie. Uh, although before I throw over to Malcolm, uh, I should also say a few words about how uh, the format of today's event is going to play out. So Malcolm will deliver a lecture of about 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, and we'll then open up the floor for about 30 minutes for questions. Uh, so everyone who's here in person today, if you've got a question, just raise your hand once the lecture is finished uh, and we'll call on you. And if you're joining online today via Zoom, uh, please feel free to post questions in the Q&A section uh, and I'll relay as many of your questions as possible uh, to Malcolm at the end. So uh, now, really, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Malcolm Lavoie, uh, Associate Professor uh, of Law here at the U of, U of A's Faculty of Law. Uh, so Malcolm is an expert in a range of different areas of Canadian law, uh, including federalism, property law and Aboriginal law. And he's also, I believe, the author of a forthcoming book on Canada's economic constitution, due in 2023? Early 2023. Early 2023. Uh, making him, of course, the perfect person, uh, I think, to teach us today about the place of property in our constitutional order. Uh, so I'd like to ask everyone to join me, uh, whether you're on Zoom or in person, uh, and put your hands together uh, and extend a very warm welcome to our speaker and teacher today, uh, Professor Malcolm Lebois. Thanks, Richard. Um, so, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to this uh, lecture on property rights and the Constitution. Uh, the title of the lecture might strike some as odd. Its placement as part of the Charter series might strike some as even uh, more odd. Uh, it's sometimes said that Canada's Constitution doesn't protect property rights, 
or even that the Constitution doesn't really have much to say about property rights. Um, and if that's true, this will be a fairly short lecture. Um, undoubtedly, the Constitution, the text of the Constitution does not protect property rights in the ways that some might have in mind, say through a clause directly mandating compensation for expropriation or permitting courts to strike down legislation for infringing property rights. Um, so the Constitution doesn't protect property in those direct ways. However, I'm gonna make the argument that the Constitution uh, as a whole does protect property rights in more nuanced ways, including certain forms of indirect protections. Um, and that's the subject we'll start with. So I have a bit of an overview here, uh, how uh, the Constitution protects property indirectly in, in, in these sort of more nuanced ways. Uh, later, we'll go on to consider why property rights were excluded from the charter in, in 1982 and some of the implications uh, that has had. Um, and finally, we'll consider some of the arguments for and against a constitutional amendment that would entrench direct protections for property um, in the charter. Um, and before I go on, I'll, I'll say that many of the ideas in this lecture come from a chapter in my forthcoming book that um, Richard generously mentioned. The book's called Trade and Commerce, Canada's Economic Constitution. And it'll be out in early 2023. Couldn't resist that quick plug. Um, okay, so let's start with the question of how the Constitution protects property. Um, if you look back at the Confederation debates leading up to the enactment of the Constitution Act 1867, um, you find that the framers were essentially unanimous in underscoring the importance of secure property rights. So here I have a statement from uh, Charles uh, Tupper. Uh, from the Nova Scotia House of Assembly in 1866. Uh, he was a, one, of the, one of the framers uh, and, and later went on to become Prime Minister of Canada. Um, and uh, Mr. Tupper uh, said in the House during the Confederation debates there, it's necessary that our institutions should be placed on a stable basis if we are to have that security for life and property and personal liberty, which is so desirable in every country. We all know that the feeling of loyalty to one's country, the pride in its institutions, lies in the fact that its institutions are able to afford protection for life and property. Uh, there are a number of other similar statements um, about the importance of property rights uh, from the various colonial legislative assemblies. Um, and the statements often link protections for property rights specifically to the institutions that are being derived from the UK constitution, and in particular, uh, the role of parliament. Uh, the historian uh, Janet Agenstadt uh, summarizes it this way, most or all of the framers believe that security for the individual, the right to life, liberty and property to use uh, the philosopher John Locke's phrase is parliament's original and primary purpose. Uh, so the framers were committed to secure property rights um, as a normative matter and their understanding of how these interests should be protected involved a link to British parliamentary institutions. Um, and that brings us to a crucial line in uh, the preamble of the Constitution Act 1867, uh, this famous reference to a constitution similar in principle to that of the United Kingdom. That phrase famously comprehends within it a great deal. Um, for instance, the words prime minister don't appear in the text of the Constitution Act 1867. Our system of responsible government with a first minister uh, who enjoys the confidence of the House of Commons, that is largely a product of the idea that our system of government is based on the British model. In addition to principles of responsible government, though, um, Canada also inherited from Britain a constitutional tradition committed to secure protections for property rights and and individual liberty. Um, however, it was a tradition that achieved that objective in a manner ultimately consistent with parliamentary supremacy, the idea of parliament um, as the supreme actor within the constitution. Um, so what are the protections that uh, Canada inherited from the UK constitution as they, as they relate to property? Well, they were principally restrictions against actions by the executive branch of the state as represented by the Crown. One of the central narratives 
of English constitutional history up to the 19th century was the development of constraints on the unilateral power of the crown to affect the rights of the people, in particular, their rights to liberty and property. And you can trace that narrative at least as far back as the Magna Carta of 1215. Um, now, the significance of the Magna Carta itself uh, can be debated. It may have been most significant for how it was reinterpreted in the 17th and 18th centuries uh, by Whig historians. Um, but the text of the Magna Carta does indeed uh, have a provision that restricts the king's power uh, to affect property interests, uh, at least the property interests of, 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 of noblemen. Um, and so here's a translation. The Magna Carta, of course, was written in Latin. Um, no free man shall be seized or imprisoned or stripped of his rights or possessions. Uh, sometimes that's translated as deceased, deprived of, of sezen, um, except by the lawful judgment of his equals or uh, by the law of the land. Um, when you read that clause, it essentially uh, allows for two exceptions to the deprivation of property, at least as it came to be understood in the English legal imagination. One could be uh, deprived of one's property based on a judgment of a court um, sitting with a jury. That's the reference to a judgment of his equals um, according to established law. And of course, that's, that's still the case. You can lose your property through a civil suit um, or as punishment uh, for an offense as determined uh, by a court. Um, the other exception, one could also be deprived of property by the law of the land. And it ultimately came to be established that the only body capable of enacting new laws uh, was parliament. Um, so here you have uh, one of the sources for the idea uh, that courts and parliaments are sort of working together uh, to restrain the unilateral power of the crown uh, to affect uh, property and other rights. Um, it took several more centuries for these um, protections to become firmly entrenched uh, in, in the English constitution. Um, that didn't really occur until the 17th century and the struggles between parliament uh, and uh, the Stuart kings. And to a lesser extent, you know, uh, the common law courts were, were somewhat aligned with, with parliament. Um, the Stuart kings had an expansive conception of royal authority on a, a number of issues, including the king's power to invalidate laws, to establish special courts to convict individuals, um, as well as powers to affect property rights through taxation and, and forfeitures. Um, so th this long struggle between the king and parliament was ultimately resolved decisively um, in parliament's favor with the so-called glorious revolution of, of 1688. Parliament ousted uh, King James II and replaced him with uh, King William of Orange, seen here, um, and Queen Mary. Um, and importantly, at this stage, the monarchy expressly agreed to abide by limits on royal authority established by Parliament. And those limits included um, important restrictions on the Crown's ability to infringe property rights. Around this time, it had become established that the Crown has no prerogative power to enact taxes, um, uh, no prerogative power to administer justice, including hearing cases that could result in a deprivation of property, uh, no prerogative power to enact legislation or to suspend the application of legislation. So laws are enacted by parliament, including, of course, laws that could affect property rights. And finally, it was established by this period that the crown has no prerogative power to take, occupy, or damage property, except for a relatively narrow exception uh, relating to the defense of the realm, um, essentially military emergencies. And uh, the, treat the quote there from the treatise by Joseph Chitty gives you a sense of how this was understood relatively narrowly by the 19th century, um, that uh, the war prerogative of the king um, is limited uh, by the perils and exigencies uh, of the military um, emergency. Incidentally, in the, in the 20th century case of Burma oil, um, even this limited power to affect property in a military emergency was found to trigger a presumptive common law right to compensation. So even when you're in this exception that allows for a prerogative power to affect property, um, it triggers a, a right to compensation um, for the, the damage or loss of, of, of property. Um, so the, the English constitution uh, came to provide essentially that in peacetime, any power to take property has to be derived from a statute. Um, and interpreting statutes that infringe property rights 
courts adopted the position that such infringements were essentially not to be presumed. Um, any ambiguity relating to a deprivation of property rights um, is resolved or ought to be resolved according to this principle of interpretation in favor of the property owner. And so not only did expropriation have to be based on statutory authority, the statutory authority had to be clear. It had to unambiguously provide for expropriation. Um, and uh, the UK courts further reinforced this in the 20th century, holding that not only was there a presumption uh, against expropriation, there was also a presumption against uncompensated expropriation. Um, and here you have the famous words of Lord Atkinson in the De Kaiser's Royal Hotel case, unless the words of the statute clearly so demand, the statute is not to be construed so as to take away the property of a subject without compensation. And so in 1867, uh, the English constitution recognized protections for property rights that were essentially baked into the separation of powers, baked into the separation of powers between the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of the state. Um, these constitutional rules denied any presumed authority on the part of the crown to infringe property and required authorization from the legislative branch. Um, and that structure wasn't accidental. It, there was a normative vision behind it. Um, and that vision was most authoritatively articulated by the philosopher John Locke. Um, Locke himself was a contemporary of the Glorious Revolution. His life was intertwined with the events uh, of the Glorious Revolution. He spent time in exile. He wrote the two treatises of government actually before 1688, but uh, didn't publish them until, until after um, for reasons that can be readily ascertained. Um, and in Locke's conception, the purpose of the state is to protect rights to life, liberty, and property. And the principal threat to those interests in Locke's conception comes from the executive branch of the state. By contrast, the legislative branch, admittedly in Locke's time, consisting of representatives of property owners, um, but the legislative branch uh, is seen as the branch that is that could be generally depended upon to act as a vigilant guardian of, of property rights. And so it made sense that deprivations of property had to be approved by the representatives of the people in the legislative assembly. Um, and that was a structure that was ex essentially expected to provide secure protections for property subject to infringements or, or perhaps uh, limits according to law uh, that had been found to be justified um, by the, the, the legislature. Um, and so this structure and these restraints on the power of the executive, they were part of what was understood in 1867 to be a constitution similar in principle to that of the United Kingdom. These constraints were constitutional in a few different senses. They were constitutional in the sense that they pertain to the separation of powers, literally how the structures of government were constituted. Um, they also gave rise to legally enforceable restrictions against government action in the absence of a clear legislative authorization. Um, but these restrictions were also constitutional in another sense, in a sense that was articulated best by uh, Justice Gerard Laforé in some of his extrajudicial writing. In an underappreciated article from 1983, just after the coming into force of the Charter, Justice Laforé, who was, who was then on the New Brunswick Court of Appeal, um, had this to say about the common law rights tradition that preceded the Charter. Um, and I should add, uh, you know, he was obviously later a, a member of the Supreme Court of Canada, had a long career as a, as a lawyer and legal academic. He was at one time the dean of this law school. And so uh, I took that, that's a picture of the portrait, much younger than he was when he was on the Supreme Court of Canada. That's the portrait that, uh, that was made of him while he was dean here. And it's right now hanging up in room 430 on the fourth floor. I took that picture yesterday. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, this is what he had to say about these protections for property uh, that we've been talking about. It's a bit of a long quote, but he's saying it better than I could. and so. Why not read it? Um, so, so far as legislative action is concerned, the courts are vigilant in reminding parliament and the legislatures of the basic political understanding underlying our parliamentary democracy. The English Revolution, the glorious revolution we've just been talking about, was not intended to replace a personal despot by a legislative despot. The authors of our system of parliamentary democracy were actuated by a philosophy of individual freedom, as articulated by, by Locke, as we just discussed, 
a philosophy that continues to inform our fundamental political institutions. The courts, the courts have a role here through a series of presumptions designed as protection against interference by the state with the liberty or property of the subject, interpret statutes so as to ensure that individual freedom or private rights of property are not arbitrarily restricted or abridged. In doing this, the courts exercise what is in essence a constitutional function. They're working along with the legislative branch to ensure the preservation of our fundamental political values. The legislature can, of course, by clear language, overturn the court's ruling. But in insisting on such clarity, the courts help to promote second thought and public debate, a debate that all recognizes an essential safeguard in a parliamentary democracy. So that's one notable understanding of what these constitutional principles mean. The legislative and judicial branches working together to protect property rights. Um, you have presumptive protections for those rights, but it is the legislative branch rather than the judiciary that has the final word on when the limits, when, when limits or infringements of those rights are justified. However, as we've seen, the legislature has to speak clearly. And there's a reason for that. Justice Laforé articulates it here as uh, th this idea that when you insist on clarity from the legislature, you make sure that the legislature actually considered those effects, actually considered that there would be a deprivation of property and found it to be justified under the circumstances. If you have an implicit taking of property, you don't have that same assurance that this was actually something that was uh, brought to the attention and uh, considered by, by legislators. Um, so these protections, I argue, are part of the constitution as the reference to a constitutional, as, as the reference to a constitution similar in principle to that of the United Kingdom reminds us. Um, however, it wasn't just the preamble um, and the common law principles that, and common law principles that provided protections for property um, under the Constitution. There are also express provisions of the Constitution Act 1867 that reflect an intention to protect property rights in a manner consistent with uh, parliamentary supremacy. Now, in this respect, one might mention the Senate, um, which at the time of Confederation was expected to be uh, composed of, of property owners um, and to represent the interests of property owners. The Senate never really uh, fulfilled that function, uh, certainly doesn't anymore. Um, if we want to look though at provisions that retain some of their significance today, the most important examples I think are sections 53 and 54 of the Constitution Act 1867. The text of those provisions here, section 53 requires that uh, taxation and spending measures have to originate in the House of Commons uh, or the Provincial Legislative Assembly. These, these provisions are made applicable to the legislative assemblies under section 90. Um, section 54 requires that uh, such measures, taxation and spending measures, have to be recommended by the cabinet. Um, so these provisions have long been understood to be connected to responsible government. They reinforce the legislative assembly's power of the purse um, and require the cabinet to retain the confidence of the assembly uh, through supply measures. Um, but Janet Ashenstadt has persuasively argued, I think, that these provisions also reinforced protections for property rights um, according to that Lockean vision that requires um, uh, the legislative assembly to authorize infringements of property, including those that, that occur through taxation. So section 53 requires that taxation measures need to be first considered by the elected representatives of the people um, who must deem them uh, to be justified in order for them to proceed. Um, section 54, this requirement that fiscal measures have to be recommended by cabinet. Um, this essentially eliminates the potential for legislative earmarks with respect to spending measures. Um, and the idea is that the cumulative effect of spending earmarks could be to increase the, the total burden on the taxpayer. Um, you, you have individual legislators representing you know, merely local interests, but the cumulative effect um, uh, could, be, could be more significant then would be the case where you have a cabinet accountable to the society as a whole um, that has to uh, agree. Um, so that's essentially where things uh, stood in 18, when the Constitution Act 1867 was enacted. Um, property was protected by limits on executive powers, um, by presumptions in the interpretation of statutes and procedural requirements uh, for fiscal measures. Um, and for most of Canada's history, courts have been largely faithful to this vision of protecting property rights indirectly um, in accordance or in, in a manner consistent with parliamentary supremacy through the, through the separation of powers. 
Um, and indeed, Canadian courts were leaders in developing some of these um, protections. For instance, the doctrine of de facto expropriation um, sort of reached its high watermark in Canada in 1978 with the Manitoba fisheries case, um, where the court arguably um, not only re recognized that property could be taken indirectly through regulatory measures, but also apparently found a common law right to um, uh, compensation for expropriation. I know around, Professor Kaplinski is here, so uh, you know, that might be a touchy subject, but uh, in my view, found a common law right to compensation um, in, those, in those circumstances. Um, and again, um, you know, that doctrine, whatever you want to say about it, it's, it's ultimately consistent with parliamentary supremacy. The parliament or the, or the legislature can come in and say, no, no, we really are doing this without compensation, as long as it speaks clearly. Um, the political branches of the state also reinforced protections for property. The 1960 uh, Canadian Bill of Rights um, provided, which is a the Canadian Bill of Rights is a non-entrenched quasi-constitutional uh, federal statute, but it included protections for property rights, um, uh, essentially a due process protection, uh, hereby recognized and declared that in Canada there have existed and shall continue to exist without discrimination, rights including the right to the enjoyment of property and the right not to be deprived thereof except by due process of law. And the Canadian Bill of Rights um, was consistent with the models that existed at that time for uh, protections of, of human rights, including um, the uh, 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which includes at Article uh, 17, a somewhat analogous right uh, against arbitrary uh, deprivations of property rights. Um, so that's kind of where things stood in the lead up to patriation and, and the enactment of the charter in 1982. Um, uh, so, you know, protections for property rights uh, had an interesting history through the drafting process of the charter. Um, the liberal government of Pierre Trudeau consistently, consistently favored including property rights as part of the charter and as part of the, the larger package of constitutional change. Um, and here I have a couple of the, uh, of the draft provisions. This, is the, this first one is a somewhat more limited right that was included in the 1978 draft bill. Um, this was, I think, at the time when the government was threatening uh, unilateral patriation uh, without, without the provinces. Um, and so this is a, a more limited right. Uh, a more robust right um, was included um, in the uh, discussion draft for the July 1980 uh, First Minister's meeting. And there were a few different versions of this, but um, consistently the Liberal government was putting forward uh, uh, drafts of the charter that included property rights. Um, however, there were also voices that, that, were, that were opposed to this. Um, so the Liberal government was in favor of property rights if they, if they could get it approved. Um, the second largest party in Parliament uh, or in the House of Commons, the, the Progressive Conservatives, also uh, favored including property rights in the charter. Um, but as I mentioned, there were also voices um, who were opposed. And so you have here um, the, the three, the leaders of the three largest parties at the time, um, Joe Clark, uh, Pierre Trudeau, the prime minister, and, and Ed Broadbent. Um, and uh, the, the voices who were opposed to including property in the charter included the NDP uh, caucus uh, led, by, led by Broadbent. Um, it also included a number of provinces, including um, in particular the NDP government of Saskatchewan. Um, and those parties were concerned about restrictions on governments and provinces ability to regulate and limit property in the public interest. And at this stage, I should mention that the US experience with a constitutionally entrenched Bill of Rights was undoubtedly one of the most significant influences um, on the drafting of the charter. And that was particularly true, I think, with respect to uh, protections for property rights. Uh, the so-called Lochner era in U.S. constitutional law uh, cast a particularly uh, long shadow over the framers of the Canadian Charter. Uh, so the Lochner era, um, for, for those who don't know, refers to the period between 1897 and about 1937 when the U.S. Supreme Court gave a robust interpretation to economic freedoms um, under the Bill of Rights and, and, and the 14th Amendment um, including protections for property and uh, liberty interests and, and use those protections to strike down uh, attempts to, to regulate market activities. Um, so the court in the, the Lochner case itself in 1897, the court struck down 
legislation setting maximum hours worked by bakers. Um, and the idea was that such legislation impaired uh, freedom of contract um, without due process. Um, Lock, so Lochner itself, the, the Lochner case itself wasn't a property rights case. It was a, a due process liberty uh, interest case. Um, but during the Lochner era more broadly, um, the court did give a robust interpretation to the US uh, Constitution's protections for property rights um, and, and did so in a way that, that limited uh, legislature's ability to, uh, to, to regulate certain economic activities. And concerns about those kinds of limits on economic regulations had, I think, a number of effects on the drafters of the charter. Um, one of them is arguably it led the framers to use the language of principles of fundamental justice in section seven rather than uh, due process. Uh, the idea was that you could avoid substantive due process if you didn't use uh, the due process language. Um, and uh, I mean, most of you probably know how well that worked out. Um, uh, but for our purposes, the more important effect of Lochner was to raise concerns uh, about the effect of a constitutional guarantee of property rights. Um, it created a kind of uh, uh, sense that uh, economic uh, rights should be opposed. And in particular, uh, there was a concern about entrenched property rights. Um, and so the idea was you, know, you might have burdensome regulations on a business struck down as an infringement of property. That's the kind of thing um, that, uh, that, that these folks were concerned about. Um, and it, it was a legitimate uh, concern, we, we, we should say. Um, more broadly, the constitutional entrenchment of property rights would have at least partly displaced parliament and provincial legislatures from their traditional role as the sort of ultimate arbiter of balancing property rights against the public interest. Um, now, of course, something similar would have happened with respect to essentially all the rights in the charter. There was this move from a system of parliamentary supremacy to a system of constitutional supremacy. But arguably that shift would have been particularly abrupt with respect to uh, property rights, given the role that legislatures have had in weighing and balancing competing economic interests in society. Um, so there were voices opposed to in including property in the charter and, and the, the concerns they articulated were, were plausible ones. Um, that said though, we, should, we shouldn't um, be too quick to say that the exclusion of property from the charter was something that would have been inevitable under the circumstances. As I mentioned, the two largest parties in the House of Commons both supported including property uh, in the charter. Uh, between the two of them, the Liberals and Conservatives had about 90% of the seats in the House of Commons at that time. Um, so the, the, the leading article on this question of you know, what led to the exclusion of property from the charter is by uh, Dwight Newman and Laurel Binion. Um, and they talk about this, this sort of process by which you move from the drafts that had property rights to the ultimate uh, text of the charter without property rights. Um, and so, you know, there was opposition from a number of provinces. Um, that may not necessarily have been fatal, especially in light of the later inclusion of the notwithstanding clause that would have permitted legislatures to override charter rights. If the notwithstanding clause had been there from the outset, that would have allayed, I think, some of the concerns uh, articulated by provinces concerned about having their power over property and civil rights um, infringed. And that's, that's an idea that Newman and Binion uh, identify. Um, they also identify some of the sort of parliamentary machinations that led, led to the exclusion of property from the charter. In uh, Newman and Binion's view, um, the, the sort of decisive moment when property was sort of shunted out of the charter was likely during the 1981 uh, Special Joint Committee on the Constitution. Um, both the NDP, uh, so the Liberals had, on, the Liberals on the committee had agreed to support a conservative proposal to put property rights back in. It had been sort of taken out. Um, the Liberal members of the committee were supportive of this, um, but uh, the NDP caucus and the um, government of Saskatchewan uh, threatened to not support the charter if, if there was a property rights clause and the Liberal members of the committee acceded to those demands. Um, later on, the uh, uh, Liberal caucus, the, the Liberals, uh, including Pierre Trudeau, uh, indicated again they were open to putting uh, property rights back in, um, but the Conservative caucus kind of overplayed its hand. Um, they introduced a measure to include property rights as a confidence motion, uh, which of course the Liberal members voted down um, if they weren't in a position to, to vote no confidence in their own government. Um, and, uh, and so that was that. 
Um, and so according to Newman and Binion, there was an element of historical contingency here. Um, events could have unfolded differently. If you had the notwithstanding clause put in earlier, that would have uh, made it less controversial. Um, potentially, if the Conservative caucus had been a little more effective than the NDP caucus, um, things could conceivably have turned out um, differently. That said, we shouldn't um, overstate the historical contingency. There were also currents in intellectual thought at around the time of patriation <clears throat> that arguably influenced this. Newman and Binion identify uh, a trend uh, in mid 20th century political thought that uh, placed more emphasis on non-economic freedoms like freedom of expression and comparatively less uh, in, uh, emphasis on the importance of property rights. Um, the charter, we should say, does remain an outlier among human rights instruments around the world in not providing for pr protection for property. Uh, the majority of such instruments do uh, include a property rights clause of some kind uh, following the model of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, at this stage as well, it's worth pausing to note uh, that there were some property rights that were entrenched in the 1982 uh, constitutional settlement. Aboriginal and treaty rights uh, protected under section uh, 35 have a proprietary dimension, most clearly in the case of Aboriginal title. Um, and the constitutional protections in section 35 have had a transformative significance in Canadian law as it relates to Indigenous peoples. Um, this is partly due, though, to the fact that these rights, uh, Aboriginal and treaty rights, were consistently neglected by the courts prior to 1982. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily the case that a constitutionally entrenched right to property outside of the Indigenous context would have had uh, such, a, such a great significance or transformative effect. Um, so property rights were left out of the Charter. Um, how much has that matter. Uh, I think it has made some difference at the margins, um, but one would have to be careful not to overstate the impact. Um, it's simply not the case that property rights in Canada are somehow radically insecure or that governments routinely take away property without a fair process or without compensation. The political branches of the state clearly have some significant commitment to the security of property rights. Just because the legislature can, through clear language, take away property without compensation doesn't mean that's typically seen to be sound policy. Um, and so property rights remain reasonably secure, uh, despite the fact that we don't have an entrenched right to property in the Charter. Um, that said, there have been instances, I think, since uh, 1982, um, where legislatures have abused their powers um, in relation to property interests in a manner that might have given rise to a claim under the Charter um, if there had been a property rights clause. And so one of the more egregious examples uh, relates to the facts in Authorson in Canada. Um, the facts are relatively straightforward. For decades, the federal government held pension funds on behalf of disabled military veterans um, without crediting the funds with any interest. That gave rise to a straightforward financial liability under, under existing law. Uh, rather than pay what it owed, the government of Brian Mulroney, admittedly at a time of fiscal restraint, um, uh, passed legislation immunizing itself against any claims uh, from the veterans. And because of the absence of property rights in the charter, um, there was no way to challenge this really on constitutional grounds. Uh, the veterans attempted to rely instead on the Canadian Bill of Rights, which again is ordinary federal legislation. Um, however, the Supreme Court gave a narrow reading of the property rights protections in, in that uh, instrument and the government's uh, you know, law was upheld. Um, and so I think there have been instances of abuse that could have been checked by a property rights clause. Um, another implication of the absence of property from the charter is that you can have relatively severe measures imposed on an individual without uh, charter scrutiny. Um, and so one example might be civil forfeiture legislation. Um, this legislation that, argue, that it doesn't have a criminal purpose in a division of power sense, but come on, um, you're taking away property based on its connection to criminal activity, um, and you're doing so on a balance of probabilities without the criminal law protections in the Charter. Um, another example might be the financial uh, measures enacted by the federal government in response to the trucker convoy in, in February of 2022. Um, so in that case, the government enacted measures that allowed it to freeze the assets um, of anyone uh, connected to the convoy, even, even simply as a supporter, 
Um, and you know, having all of one's assets frozen can have fairly severe effects on an individual, um, are arguably comparable um, to, uh, to, to uh, having your liberty taken away. Um, you're essentially cut off from the modern economy and, and society, and potentially you know, unable to do so much as buy groceries or pay your mortgage. Um, and so asset freezes targeting specific individuals are typically uh, seen as a fairly extreme and unusual measure. Um, they're most often associated with uh, terrorism legislation. That's a connection uh, made in a recent article uh, by Professor Michelle Gallant from the University of, of Manitoba. And so this is a powerful tool in terms of its effects on the individual. Um, but because you know, financial measures of this nature are only targeting assets rather than a liberty interest, um, charter protections uh, may not apply. Um, and so you know, maybe every measure the um, uh, government took against the convoy was, was justified and necessary. Um, but even if that's so, it's worth at least pausing to note that the exclusion of property rights from the charter um, allows some fairly extreme measures potentially to, to evade uh, charter scrutiny. Um, so there have definitely been, been, I think, some cases where uh, the exclusion of a charter right to property has made a difference, um, though we should be careful about concluding that, you know, that, that uh, you know, property rights are somehow radically insecure. Um, in addition, though, to these direct effects, these, these you know, instances where you could have struck down legislation based on um, a charter right, um, there has also been cases where you know, the exclusion of property, or we can also point to the idea that the exclusion of property could have had an expressive effect. Um, I'd like to suggest that the exclusion of property rights from the charter has sent a kind of message to the effect that um, property rights may not be all that significant. Um, and that this has had an effect on other areas of law where courts have developed, um, have been in the position of developing uh, protections for property that predate the charter. Um, so I, I previously mentioned the idea that courts enforce legal presumptions against expropriation um, without compensation, unless it's clearly authorized by the legislature. In the 20th century, this presumption grew into the doctrine of de facto expropriation. And the basic idea behind that doctrine is that regulatory measures can fundamentally deprive an owner of her, of her rights um, and that they should be treated as an expropriation, giving rise to a uh, uh, presumptive right to compensation unless the um, uh, legislature says otherwise. And this doctrine was developed into fairly robust form uh, by the Supreme Court in the 1970s in the case of Manitoba fisheries, this arguable presumptive common law right to compensation where you're fundamentally deprived of your, of your property interest. Um, in the 2006 uh, case of CPR in Vancouver though, um, the court changed the test for de facto expropriation um, in a way that has made it all but impossible to bring a claim. And I should say at this stage that I'm counsel for an intervener um, in a case that's at the Supreme Court that's reconsidering um, the test for de facto expropriation. Um, we'll see how that goes, but, but in any event, um, the CPR case dealt with restrictions on the development of the Arbutus Rail Corridor in Vancouver, some very valuable land. CPR argued that the restrictions imposed by the city is amounted by the city amounted to a de facto expropriation. The court disagreed, but for our purposes, the important element of the case is that in coming to that conclusion, the court uh, reformulated the test for de facto expropriation. These are the, the, the elements of the test that the court laid down. Um, and the first branch of the test is especially problematic. Uh, it arguably misunderstands the purpose of de facto expropriation, which is about the effects that a government measure has on the rights of the owner, not about what the government is getting. Um, if the government is acquiring a formal property right, then it's a de jure expropriation, not a de facto expropriation. Um, while he was still an academic, Justice Russell Brown, um, currently of the Supreme Court of Canada, was a strong critic of the CPR decision. Um, and about a decade ago, I heard him uh, make a somewhat provocative suggestion about the case uh, during the course of a conference presentation. Um, he, if, you know, based on my memory in his remarks, Justice Brown linked the CPR decision to the exclusion of property rights from the charter. Not in the sense that a charter property right would have directly made a difference, though it might have. Um, rather, what he meant was that the exclusion of property from the charter had an expressive effect. Um, it sent a message to, to, the, to courts and others that property rights are simply not that important. Um, and that message has been internalized um, in this sort of weakening of these non-entrenched uh, common law protections for property rights. 
And so I think you can see that in de facto expropriation. I think another example might be the due process protections in the Canadian Bill of Rights. In the Authorson cases I mentioned, um, the Supreme Court of Canada gave a very narrow reading of those protections, essentially ruling out the possibility of challenging legislation on the basis of, of those rights. Um, and we might also say something about Section 53 of the Constitution Act 1867, this provision that requires taxation measures to originate um, in the House of Commons or the Legislative Assembly. I, th I think the Supreme Court has undermined that provision in at least two ways. Um, so firstly, it's permitted Parliament and legislatures to delegate their taxing power to the executive, meaning that you can have new or increased taxes um, that are not actually approved uh, by the Legislative Assembly. Um, and secondly, uh, courts have developed a large and seemingly ever-growing category of regulatory charges that are exempt from Section 53. Again, allowing for compulsory payments, significant compulsory payments, um, that are not subject to these uh, constitutional uh, protections. Um, so I'm not the first to criticize the court's uh, Section 53 jurisprudence. Uh, the late Peter Hogg, for instance, was of the view that permitting delegation of the taxing power was simply not consistent with the text, here it is, with the text and purpose of the provision. Um, Hogg argued that the court's interpretation of Section 53 undermined an important textual pr protection for responsible government. I would like to suggest that it also has, a, has an effect on the security of property rights, since it allows the administrative state to impose compulsory charges uh, without meaningful oversight by the legislative branch. Um, so that's where things have stood. Um, the exclusion of property rights hasn't meant that property is somehow radically insecure, um, but it may have had some effect. It may have had some effect in, in uh, certain types of cases, um, cases of abuse or, or instances where you might have uh, serious measures imposed without charter scrutiny. And I think, I mean, this is more speculative, it may have had an expressive effect, um, sending a kind of message that property rights aren't that important and leading to a sort of watering down of some of these non-entrenched protections. Um, so what about the future? Uh, ever since 1982, there have been calls to amend the Constitution to include protections for property in the Charter. In 1988, for instance, the House of Commons passed a resolution to amend the Constitution to include such a right, um, though it was not taken up by the provinces as, as required under the amending formula. Um, the prospects for an amendment under the general amending formula, the seven provinces um, with 50% of the population, the prospects for such an amendment, I think, are quite dim in the near term, um, given the high level of consensus that would be required. Um, it's been suggested that property rights could be protected within a single province through the bilateral amending formula. Um, so that may be a more realistic possibility, at least in the near term. Um, but what are the uh, considerations to, 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 to weigh in assessing whether such an amendment would be a good thing. Um, I'll lay out just a few um, in my sort of final remarks here. Um, I think, uh, you know, amending the Constitution with, to include a, an entrenched right to property would provide more, fun, more robust protections for a fundamental right of individuals. Um, this could be important if uh, measures like asset freezes somehow become normalized. Um, you might want to have that kind of charter, charter scrutiny. And I've, I've noted uh, in a previous uh, article that I wrote that in the 20th century, technology arguably makes it easier to free someone out of the economy than ever before, um, where we sort of have a diminishing amount of cash that's used, digital assets are sort of everything. Um, with a few clicks, it's possible to essentially shut someone out of society. Um, and there's an argument to be made that those types of measures, even if they're only implicating property, um, should have some sort of uh, charter scrutiny. Um, and the second sort of, I suppose, advantage of an entrenched right to property would be that expressive effect, avoiding sending the message that property rights are somehow of lesser importance, uh, underscoring the importance not only of whatever ends up being entrenched in the charter, but also those non-entrenched rights that predate the charter. On the other hand, there are also concerns that could be raised about uh, such an entrenched property right. To my mind, the most significant concern um, relates to the judicialization of politics. Um, recall my contention that property rights were not unprotected prior to 1982. They were and are protected by an ancient constitutional tradition that puts the legislature rather than the courts in the position of determining whether infringements are justified. And you can make a case that the legislature is better suited to that role, um, particularly 
on economic questions that involve the weighing of competing interests within society. But for that to work, or at least for it to be effective in upholding individual rights, you need legislators who take their role seriously and who apply meaningful scrutiny to propose measures that would infringe the liberty or property of the people. Uh, so I'll leave it at that, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much for your attention. Well, thanks very much for uh, such a wonderful, insightful uh, presentation. Uh, I think we actually only have about five minutes left for questions, but let's extend that. Uh, do we have any questions, first of all, from folks who are here in person? Right here. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the presentation, uh, Chris as well. Um, I want to ask you about what you think has been the practical effect that you can in more detail uh, about excluding property rights from the Constitution. That there's maybe a pedagogical, maybe grading of them. Um, I think that it's fair to say that it's probably not the area of proper way to describe it. If you look at sections 26 and 31 of the chart, both of which state that the Charter doesn't expand anyone's powers and that no previous uh, rights continue to exist. Notwithstanding that, I guess, what does that say about the, um, the power of those provisions? And do you think anything different may have gone on had Section 26 used the word disparagement that is used in the Ninth Amendment of the US Constitution that is maybe a more firm admonition to not affect the pre-existing uh, rights. Now, admittedly, the Ninth Amendment has sometimes been used as a source of constitutionalized rights that probably absolutely wanted to avoid, which maybe gets into the whole judicialization of, uh, of politics that you come at the end. But maybe that's just some noise that appears to have thoughts on. Yeah, Th thank you so much, uh, Gerard. Th those are great uh, questions. Um, and so, yeah, in terms of the sort of pedagogical effects, um, I think just sort of, is that sort of the expressive effect of, that this, this idea that the charter sends a certain message about what rights are important. Um, and there are a few different channels that could go through. It could go through sort of directly in terms of courts. It could also go indirectly where, you know, when you're discussing human rights in law school, there's no discussion of property rights because uh, of the absence of rights from the charter. And, and, and that sort of has a longer term uh, impact. Um, your more specific, the more specific part of your question, though, was about Section 26 of the Charter, and that uh, article by Gerard Lafaure uh, that I uh, sort of had a long ex excerpt from uh, specifically notes the existence of Section 26, which essentially says this Charter doesn't take away from any uh, rights that, um, that that previously existed, and that would include these um, uh, non-entrenched rights uh, to property. Um, and you see, should you make this this this, this point that the that the language of that provision um, essentially just acknowledges that they continue to exist. It doesn't uh, use the language of the Ninth Amendment of, of the, of the um, U.S. Bill of Rights that says, uh, essentially refers to disparagement. Um, and would, would, would different language have made a difference? Um, maybe, uh, probably not though. Um, you know, that's sort of those sort of nuances when we're talking about an expressive effect of this nature, um, those sort of nuances might not matter so much. And there is the risk. I mean, the charters, the, the, the framers of the charter clearly did not intend for there to be an entrenched right to property. Um, and that should inform our understanding of, say, Section 7 or indeed potentially Section 8, um, provision dealing with unreasonable searches or seizures, um, that you know, we, should, we should be careful to uh, respect that choice. Um, and so you know, maybe they use that, that more limited language to avoid having that implication. Would it have made a difference in how the charter was received and, and sort of how the importance of property rights were understood? I'm not so sure. Great question. So we've got a batch of great questions here on Zoom. Uh, I'll start with, uh, I'll just read this. As you mentioned, uh, Justice Lafaray said that courts are there to remind legislatures of the basic political principle of the philosophy of individual freedom. What becomes of these constitutional protections when courts no longer share that philosophy? Yeah, great question. Um, and so we should be, we should be careful to, to note that um, you know, these principles we're talking about, I think I tried to emphasize that, they're not neutral principles. These are, these are principles that are derived from the liberal tradition, 
Um, I specifically drew the connection to uh, John Locke. And at the time of the Glorious Revolution and in, in, in the 17th and, and in the 18th century, the common law courts really shared these commitments, uh, commitments to um, a sort of classical liberal view of the world, um, sort of Whig understanding of uh, politics. Um, and uh, that informed how they developed these doctrines, including the protections for property um, as an interpretive matter. And uh, maybe we shouldn't be surprised if those ideological commitments are no longer as prevalent in society, no longer as prevalent within the judiciary, um, that you have less adherence to those, to those, um, to those ideals. Uh, and so, you know, there's kind of a straightforward line you can draw between sort of judicial ideology and um, the effects that we've seen. I would push back a little bit though on the idea that property rights are no longer seen to be as important. Certainly the grounds, um, and I make this argument in my book, the grounds for um, uh, protecting property have shifted over time. You know, I don't think you have as much adherence to sort of the Lockean ideal of natural rights to property. Um, there's been a kind of move towards a pluralistic conception of property rights, particularly in the 20th century, um, based on different types of interests that individuals have. Liberty interests, um, alongside uh, more instrumental concerns like uh, uh, sort of, uh, economic concerns, but also things like uh, uh, virtue and human flourishing, um, interests like the personal connection that people can have with property. Um, and so property is still seen to be important, um, just not as much in the Lockean sense. And so I think there still is a place, even if we acknowledge that shift in ideology, um, there is still a place for uh, a commitment to the importance of property rights, especially if we're talking about a doctrine that allows the legislatures to alter that, right? So even on, you know, uh, you, you, might, you might think of property as being understood in more progressive terms, uh, terms that are less absolute than lock. Um, and that I don't think is inconsistent with a conception of saying, okay, we're gonna presumptively protect property, but we are gonna let the elected representatives of the people redefine those interests and limit them in the public interest. Um, I don't think that the shifts in ideology have been so abrupt that these doctrines um, no longer uh, have relevance. Before we go to another Zoom question, in-person attendees, anybody else have a question? Let's do another Zoom one then. Um, Malcolm, I think you've touched on this already, but maybe you could say a bit more about which specific provinces were opposed to the entrenchment of property rights uh, during yeah. repatriation. And, uh, uh, why were they opposed? Sure, yeah. So the, the, the list of provinces, um, off the top of my head, I'm, I'm sure about Saskatchewan. Um, I think it might have been prevalent among the uh, sort of gang of eight that um, were opposed to the charter uh, more generally. Um, off the top of my head, I don't think I could list the ones that specifically articulated concerns about property, although it may very well have included um, Alberta. I, I think the reasons for it are relatively straightforward, though. The, the idea was that a protection for property is going to disproportionately affect provincial legislatures because um, property is mostly under provincial jurisdiction, under the, the expansive property and civil rights power. And so there was a, a concern that this was going to have a disproportionate impact on provinces, limiting um, their ability to regulate property in the public interest. Uh, there were a few more specific policies that I think uh, Newman Binion articulate as being important. Prince Edward Island wanted to be able to uh, restrict uh, non-resident ownership and they were concerned that a property rights clause might uh, get in the way of that. I think that was also a concern in the case of Saskatchewan. Um, it may have also had a significance with respect to natural resources. Um, natural resources also under provincial jurisdiction, so it goes to that disproportionate effect on um, you know, items under provincial jurisdiction. And uh, the, uh, in, in Western Canada, the struggle for control of natural resources um, was a significant one. And the idea that provinces' uh, ability to regulate um, those matters could be limited by a property rights clause uh, was, was a matter of concern. So I really love this next question because I'm a legal theory guy and it's a hypothetical, which legal theorists love. Uh, if hypothetically, a draft amendment to include property rights protections in the Charter arose, do you think it should be similar to the language proposed in the 1980s draft section or different in light of the 21st century? Yeah, and so that's a really good question. I mean, I've sort of been, you know, in a relatively short talk, I've been talking about a property rights clause 
without going into too much detail on the different types of property rights clauses you can have. You can have a relatively weak clause, like that clause that we um, saw from the 1978 um, draft bill, which essentially said, you know, property rights are protected, but can be infringed according to law. A provision like that would primarily have an expressive effect, right? It would say, um, I think it would essentially say, you know, property rights are important, they're protected in the charter, they can be limited by law, by legislation, um, and so we're not really limiting legislatures in a big way, other than to sort of reinforce those pre-1982 presumptions that, you know, property rights are important. Or you can have a far more robust right, right? You can uh, think about property being um, protected uh, in a provision along the lines of uh, Section 7, um, principles of fundamental justice interpreted in this robust, substantive way. Um, that would uh, limit uh, the, the ways in which um, property could be infringed. And of course, you could have a provision um, uh, uh, similar to uh, the US Constitution, where you protect, uh, you require just compensation, potentially also a public purpose for any expropriation of property. Um, and so what, what type of clause would we look at if we were you know, in, enacting such a clause today? Um, I think there, you know, there's a range of options. You can have a weaker clause that would primarily have that expressive effect. You can have a more, more robust clause. I will say that um, the options on the table have expanded a bit um, since, since 1982. There are other examples. Um, the uh, South African constitution, for instance, has a very interesting property rights clause that sort of underscores the importance of, uh, of, of property of, 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 um, uh, for everyone. Um, and uh, the importance of addressing injustices that have existed in, in uh, the allocation of property and, and giving a role to uh, government in addressing those injustices, while at the same time providing a certain form of protection for property. And so if you wanted to protect property in a manner that sort of took into account, um, you know, moves towards a more progressive property theory, uh, a broader understanding of the importance of regulating and limiting property in the public interest, you might look to the South African constitution as, as one type of example. Um, and, and indeed, you might be more likely to get a broad, uh, the broad kind of support that you would need with a clause of that nature, rather than a, a more um, a clause that's sort of modeled on the U.S. Constitution. Great question. Let's go back in person again. If anybody in person has any more questions, yes. Go ahead. How does that Yeah, so uh, good question. What practical difference would it make, especially if we compare ourselves to the United uh, States? And certainly I, I listed civil forfeiture as an example. Civil forfeiture definitely exists in the United States um, and has uh, mostly been found to be constitutional up to this point. Um, you know, if we're looking for differences in American and Canadian law, probably the biggest one right now is the doctrine of de facto expropriation um, in the United States called regulatory takings. Um, it is more robust in, in the US. You have uh, instances where you have per se takings um, or you know, property that's, that's occupied or, or you lose all the economic value. Um, and then you also have cases where there's sort of a more robust balancing or a broader balancing test. Um, I think it's pretty clearly easier to get compensation on that test for regulatory measures that sort of fundamentally deprive an owner of the benefits of ownership than it is under current Canadian law. And of course, under current Canadian law, 
Um, even if something is found to be a de facto expropriation, the legislature can override it. Whereas in the United States, under the regulatory takings doctrine, that's a constitutional doctrine that can't be overridden by the state legislature. So I would probably say de facto expropriation is maybe the biggest, most significant area. Um, and uh, and you know, not that not that de facto expropriations happen all the time, but they um, are litigated with some regularity in the United States and with some success. In contrast to Canada, where very limited litigation because the test is um, so restricted. Um, you know, on the trucker convoy thing, uh, yeah, you might be right. I, I do think that uh, I'm not sure the regulations as enacted would have satisfied due process, uh, even under a, a sort of more permissive approach uh, in the United States. So there might have been something there. Um, but uh, yeah, I take your point certainly that more broadly, terrorism measures and civil forfeiture exist in the United States and, and could be upheld, you know, depending on how. Uh, uh, constitutional provisions interpreted here. Um, and of course, there's uncertainty as to how a provision would be interpreted. That's another potential consideration um, in thinking about such, such, a, such a move. I think we maybe have time for two more questions at the most. Uh, so let's do one Zoom and one in person. If anyone else in person has a question, just raise your hand now. Uh, I'll paraphrase a much longer Zoom one. Uh, the, the question is essentially, and I hope I'm not doing a disservice to the question, um, is there any difference in the extent of constitutional protection for property generally and for intellectual property specifically? Uh, so that would turn on the, um, the difference between intellectual property and, other, and forms of tangible property. That would turn, I suppose, on, the, on the, um, how, the, how the provision was, was framed. If it's property in general, then I think it would extend to um, other types of interests, non-tangible interests, interests uh, even created under, under statute. Um, you could have uh, you could have a more limited provision, but presumptively, um, once a property interest of that nature is vested, um, a deprivation of it would trigger a property rights protection. I would, I would say. So, final question of the day then from our first attendee, which I think is appropriate. You mentioned at a point the idea of the ability of the legislature to delegate the ability to. <clears throat> Forfeited asset, you know, it's expropriated asset. Yeah. How do you stop under the model of you know, supremacy or expropriation? How do you stop the legislation from deciding to, you know, hand that power off to the executive? Yeah, and you know, so the question is, you know, essentially about uh, delegations of authority. The restriction in Section Fifty Three is about taxation authority. Um, uh, and you know, the, you know, in the Supreme Court's defense, I kind of made the case against what they've done. The case for what they've done is, well, um, the delegation gets approved by the House of Commons, and so it gets considered uh, at some stage. And your question is, how do we stop or restrain legislatures in Parliament from making those decisions to delegate sweeping powers? This is a bigger problem than just um, measures that affect property. Um, it's increasingly a trend in legislation to have it structured along broad delegations of authority, um, sort of blank checks to the executive branch uh, to, to do and implement what they want. Um, I think the only, you know, there's solutions around the edges with like Section 53, but the broader solution there has to be a cultural change within um, parliamentary institutions that, um, uh, you know, they're obviously under, uh, under the you know, a great degree of influence from the executive branch of the state. Um, to having legislators take their role seriously, not just as, as it relates to fundamental rights, but also as it relates to um, things like delegation. I think that's the only sort of sustainable solution that you'd have for that. Good question. So I think unfortunately that's all we've got time for today. Um, I'm just going to close with uh, a few quick thank yous. Uh, so a huge thank you to, to Malcolm, obviously, for providing us with such a fascinating, insightful talk. Um, a huge thank you to everyone who joined us uh, today, whether you're in person or on Zoom. Um, and a huge thank you to the Centre's other staff members, uh, Aubrey Abaya and Zara Ahmed, for making this event possible and for making sure that everything ran smoothly. Hopefully it did. Uh, so that's all that we have time for today. Um, but we really hope that you'll, you'll join us for our next event, which is on the Alberta Sovereignty Act uh, that's taking place in person and online uh, on October 5th at 5 p.m. Uh, and if you'd like to know more about our events uh, or more about the work that we do at the Centre, you can visit us at uh, constitutionalstudies.ca and on Twitter. Uh, so thank you again to Malcolm uh, and we'll see you all next time, I hope.